On the night of April the 13th, 1944, I escaped from Germany. I had been hiding in Freiburg for nearly a year, forged papers, forged ration cards. And then some people I knew put me in touch with a courier for a fee he would help you to cross the border to Switzerland. He took my money. We walked. I don't know how long I was close to collapse. And then he left me. He said, follow the stream. There's a customs house. There'll be no light, but you'll find it. I felt between two worlds. I'd lost all sense of time and place. I kept falling, but felt nothing. And then, at last, I stumbled, and there was concrete, and such a pain in my leg. I was aware of a man coming out of a doorway. I asked him where I was. Sagen Sie mir gleich, wo ich bin. Seien Sie ruhig. Sie sind in der Schweiz. Warten Sie, ich komme. And he said, You are in Switzerland. You are safe. It's all right. I'm coming. And Germany was behind me forever. This is the story of the Nazi persecution of the Jewish people as told through the autobiography of one woman, Elspeth Rosenfeld. Elspeth was Christian, but her father and her husband were Jewish. And had she been caught escaping, she would have faced arrest, imprisonment, almost certain death. The fate shared by the many million victims of Nazi racism. Yes, please, as soon as you can. She's from Germany, I think. The customs man telephoned for a doctor, and he gave me some brandy, and then we waited. He's very busy, but he'll be here as soon as he can. And I don't know why, he, he didn't seem to want me to fall asleep, so he kept asking questions. And I found myself telling him everything. The whole story. Is it too painful to talk about? No. No, strangely, quite the opposite. Because, you see, to tell my story meant I was alive to tell it. It meant I knew how the ending went. And the ending was me, there, talking to this foreigner. For so many years, I'd been terrified the ending might be quite different. <laughs> Elspeth's story begins in 1933. The Nazis had swept to power. Their stormtroopers were now protected by the government and one of their favorite excesses, the persecution of Germany's Jews, was now government policy. There were arrests, beatings. Stormtroopers urged people not to shop in Jewish stores. Seems so long ago, I remember the shock. Yes, but this explosion of hatred, it was so overdramatic, I couldn't take it seriously. I remember I was working in the prison services. I was a social worker. I had my hat on. I was on my way out the door, and the director phoned, and he said, you shouldn't come to work anymore. And I asked, why? And he said, you wouldn't be safe here anymore. And I remember thinking, that was so funny. I mean, of all places, how could I not be safe in a prison? <laughs> was he a Nazi? I suppose so. I think that deep down many 
Germans disliked the Jews, but they kept their hatred bottled up, and then in 33, pop, the lid came off. For years, the Nazis had spread the lie that Jews were to blame for Germany's decline. Now their policy was to stamp out that Jewish influence. Books by Jewish authors were burnt, Jewish civil servants, lawyers, doctors lost their jobs and suffered public humiliation. For Germany's Jewish community, the basic right just to live and enjoy life like anyone else was suddenly under threat. They were ordinary Germans through and through, but now they'd been picked out, branded un-German, an enemy within. Why? Deep down, it was jealousy. The Jewish community was successful. Many German doctors, lawyers, bankers were Jewish. The Nazis twisted this success. In their propaganda, they said it was based on selfishness. But the Jews had got rich at Germany's expense. It was all lies, but the propaganda was powerful, and it fed old hatreds, born long before the Nazis came to power. When my mother married a Jew, her family would have no more to do with her. They turned her away, their own daughter. What had a Jew done to them? I don't know. They saw with blinkers, and so they never got to know my father's family. They were wonderful people, so full of life. And then when my turn came, just like my mother, I married a Jew. They were my community. Siegfried. This is his photograph. Is he... Dead? No, he is in England, I think. I have heard nothing for so long. Elspeth married Siegfried in 1930. Five years later, such a union would have been impossible. Marriages between Jews and German citizens, or those of similar blood, are forbidden. The marriage law, one of the Nuremberg decrees of 1935, was aimed at protecting the purity of German blood. The Nazis divided people into racial types. They said Germans were descended from the Aryan race. This propaganda film shows Aryans of old, the Teutonic Knights, supposedly the root of all German culture and nobility. Pure Aryan Germans could be recognized from their blonde hair and blue eyes. It was all a fantasy, but the fantasy was dressed up as science. Germans were being taught to think of other races as somehow less than perfect. And the German people bought the lie. Signs cropped up. Jews not wanted here. With the Nuremberg decrees, this discrimination was set down in stone. German Jews lost their citizenship. They lost the right even to call themselves German. And yet, you know, the funny thing, how losing your citizenship hurts less than those silly, petty details. Not being able to sit down in a tram. Public benches painted bright yellow, set aside for Jews only. I would not have sat there for my soul. In any case, you're not Jewish. No, but I'm not Aryan either. Oh. Half and half. It was so confusing. They call it a science. They like to think it's so clear-cut, but... I had a friend. He was Jewish, but tall 
and blonde. I went with him past a restaurant. There was a big sign, Jews keep out. And he said, watch this. And he strolled in and he flirted with the waitress. And when she brought his food, he said, oh, sorry, I didn't see the sign. And he just left, leaving her shaking in anger. After Kristallnacht, they took him away. The Nazis never liked to be mocked.